All right, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. It's so great to have you all here this evening and to spend a little more time walking with Jesus as he stands on trial in so many different ways. And tonight we're going to be looking at the word testimony and seeing how that plays out in the life in, in this time for Jesus and Peter as they're kind of compared in our reading to, for tonight and then see how that word testimony applies to our lives. What does that mean for you and me every day? So we'll begin with our opening hymn, In the Hour of Trial. Everything will be up here on the screen, but the hymns you can also follow along in your hymnals if you like. And it's hymn number 406 in the hymnal. continue this evening with our confession. So taking the opportunity to be authentic and open with God and to see who he is and confess that and to understand who we are and to confess that. So in the name of our God, to whom all hearts are open and from whom no secrets are hidden. Amen. Amen. I confess that I am by nature sinful. I am guilty of many sins. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me. For all this I am sorry. I pray for forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Jesus says to his people, to us, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. And by Christ's authority, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our reading this evening comes from Luke chapter 22, verses 47 to 71. As we focus in on Jesus' work tonight, we not only see him at the end of his time in Gethsemane, but then also his trial before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. Thank <laughs> you. 
While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance, and when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? and they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, If I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You say that I am. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. We'll continue with our next song, which portrays Jesus in that courtroom, standing before Caiaphas and the rest of the Sanhedrin. Uh, this, this, the hymn is, is uh, found in your hymnals. You can find, hi, <laughs> sorry, you can find that. It's hymn number 402. We'll also be using the Koine version, so you're welcome to follow along with that on the screen. He stood before the court on trial instead of us. 
He made its power to her Condemned to face the cross Our King accused of treachery Our God abused for blasphemy These are the crimes that tell The tales of human guilt Our sins, our death, our hell The sentence must be passed, the unknown prisoner killed. The price is paid at last, the law of God fulfilled. He takes our blame and from that day, the accuser's claim is wiped away. Shall we be judged and tried in Christ our trial is done We live for he has died our condemnation gone In Christ are we both dead and raised alive and free his name be praised At the very end of that section from Luke chapter 22, we heard Jesus' enemies say, we have heard his testimony. What's testimony? Evidence. evidence. And where is the evidence usually presented at or asked for? In a courtroom. So you take a witness who will put their hand up and the other hand often is on the Bible and you're asked to swear that you're telling the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. And then you give your testimony. It's your witness statement. It's the truth, what you saw and you're supposed to lay that out for everyone to hear. Jesus gave testimony. Peter gave testimony. But their two witness statements are so different. And that's what we're going to be exploring tonight as we talk about their testimony and then how that applies in our lives. What kind of testimony are we to give as we think about the things that Jesus has done for us? It starts in the courtroom. Jesus' enemies have gathered around him and they're asking him questions but not really giving him much time to answer. They're spending their time mocking him. We heard in Luke's gospel that they blindfolded him and hit him and asked him to prophesy and say who it was. But all that time, how did Jesus respond? He didn't. He remained quiet. He knew that all of this was coming. He had seen it already as he prayed in the garden. He knew that the mob was coming to arrest him, take him away, and have that trial. But to call it a trial really isn't truth either. It was a mockery of justice. Some people might call it a kangaroo court. It's no justice at all. They brought in all kinds of witnesses. Supposedly, they could bring testimony that would prove Jesus was not who he said he was. But there was a problem with all of their testimony. They couldn't agree. And the law of Moses said you have to have at least two or three people corroborate the evidence in order to convict. So Jesus shouldn't have been convicted. The only person who brought any kind of coherent testimony was a man who said, I heard him say that he was going to tear down the temple and raise it back up in three days. Which is what Jesus said. But the man didn't realize, didn't understand, Jesus was talking about himself that he would rise from the dead three days after he was killed. 
Finally, the high priest asked Jesus directly. He put him under oath and said, Are you the Son of God? And Jesus answered, I am. I am. Giving them not only his affirmative answer, but telling them who he was, that he was indeed the Lord, the God who had given Moses life, who had given Moses the words to write down in the law that he is the I am. That was Jesus' powerful, calm, clear, truthful testimony. At the very same time, Luke has Peter. Jesus is inside the high priest's house. Peter is outside in the courtyard area. Now, Peter was always willing to give testimony, and he had given a beautiful confession of who Jesus was just a short time earlier. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But Jesus had warned him already, this night you will not give good testimony. In fact, you will deny me three times. And of course, Peter doesn't believe it and boldly tells Jesus, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Never! How long did it take? Just a few minutes. Peter finds a spot next to the fire where it's a little bit warmer in the cold night as he waits to hear what's happening inside. And, and as he sits by the fire, a servant girl takes a closer look and says, weren't you one of his disciples? <laughs> no, 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 not me. You must have somebody else. Well, that was quick. Not good testimony. Another person sees him there a little bit later and asks the same question. Aren't you one of his disciples? I thought I, I've seen you with him. And Peter once again denies it. And it happens a third time. We, we know that you were with him because you are a Galilean. And in Matthew's gospel it adds, your accent gives you away. No. Peter began to call down curses on himself, asking God to strike him down if he knew this man. And then he said, I am not one of his disciples. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this man. Powerful testimony. But a testimony born of fear instead of faith. What was Peter afraid of? What might he have been frightened about as he sat in this courtyard? What do you think? What would frighten you? Being arrested, yeah. Yeah, because this is bigger than just a servant girl recognizing him. Matthew says that there were soldiers scattered around the courtyard, and so if they heard anyone might be a follower of Jesus, they could be in danger of being arrested. Yeah. Any other reasons Peter might have been afraid that night? He might have killed him. Okay, then he might have lost his life if he's captured, if he's found. So Peter's got a lot going on in his head, doesn't he? And rightly so, Peter had fears about what might happen. It's a frightening situation. But at the same time, his denial outside was just as sinful, just as wrong, just as false as the men who paraded in front of Jesus accusing him falsely. Sometimes fear leads to a false testimony. What might we be afraid of when it comes to our relationship with Jesus and the witness that we might give? What makes us afraid? Someone will forgive me. Okay, maybe God won't forgive me if I don't say the right thing, if I don't do the right thing. Jeff? Yeah, they might reject us. Perception. Perceptions, yeah. We face all kinds of fears when it comes to the witness that we are to give. Because if we say something and we are rejected, then what happens to our friendships or the relationship that we're in? It can disappear and suddenly we are alone instead of supported by those people. Or maybe... Maybe we'd feel anger coming 
because of, because of our confession about Jesus. This is who we are. This is what we believe. And people get angry about it and, and make fun of us and, and ridicule us for what we believe. And we're afraid. We're afraid. But you know, Jesus brought something up in our gospel reading on Sunday when it comes to being afraid about our witness. He said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their soul? What good is it if we retain our friendships and we aren't made fun of and we're part of the group and yet we lose our relationship with Jesus? What happens if we stand before him when he does return on the clouds in glory and he says, I don't know you because you didn't confess your faith in me? Which, which is more valuable? To stand with Jesus. To witness about him. To testify about him. To give our testimony. Because we know who he is. We trust in him. You know, Peter was caught in a very difficult position, wasn't he? And he got caught, literally, in that difficult position. Because the next thing we hear from Luke is this. Just as Peter was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. I have always wondered, what did Peter see in Jesus' face when Jesus looked at him? Was it deep disappointment? Sorrowful sadness? hurting heartache, unbounded love, what, what did Peter see? Regardless of what Jesus' face looked like, Peter was heartbroken himself to the point that he went out and wept bitter tears because he had done exactly what he had boasted he would never do. We may not know what Jesus' face looked like or what Peter saw, but I think I have seen that face in my parents' faces, in my teachers' faces, when they told me something that I probably wouldn't ever want to do, and that this is a bad choice, don't do it, here's what's going to happen, here are the consequences, and I went and did it anyways. And the look on their faces was heartbreaking because they knew and they couldn't stop me, and I did it anyways, and now I had to, to pay those consequences. Or the challenges that, that we feel when, when we have the opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus and it slips through our fingers. And I think I know what Jesus' face must look like because I blew it. But don't run like Peter with bitter tears. But look at Jesus' face. And what we see there is not rage and anger and hurt and disappointment because we've done it again. But he looks at us once again with a love that is deeper than the deepest ocean and higher than the extent of the universe. And he calls us back. Just like he was calling Peter with that look, he wanted Peter to come back, to return, to repent, and to know how much he loved him and how great his forgiveness was, that he was willing to bear all that false testimony, even Peter's denial, so that he could rescue us. Don't just look closely, but also listen closely to who he says he is. He said... I am the Son of God. I am who you say I am. I am. And how many times hasn't Jesus encouraged us by telling us the same thing? I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I am the resurrection and the life. We hear him say those things and those words bring us hope. Because his testimony is always true. He never lies. And so we can be confident that when he tells us who he is, and especially when he says, I am your Savior, 
We belong to him. He is ours and we are his. Jesus had just one more encouragement this night, trying to call Caiaphas and the others to him. He said, but from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. And Matthew adds that Jesus said, and I will come on the clouds of heaven and you'll see me. Daniel had promised that 500 years earlier. And now Jesus says to Caiaphas and the rest, this is me. The one you have battered and bloodied, I will return to judge the living and the dead. I will judge those who have spoken falsely against me and those who have stood with me. Unbeliever and believer. And what do we have to be afraid of when Jesus returns one day? The answer is nothing. Nothing. Because the one who accepted and bore all of that false testimony did that so that we could stand perfect before a righteous God. Holy, because Jesus earned it, connected to him through our baptism, sins washed away. We truly belong to him. That doesn't mean that giving testimony is going to be an easy thing for the rest of our lives. There are times that we're going to be going about our business and suddenly we are thrust onto the witness stand. Why do you follow this Jesus? Why do you always live like this? Why do you make the choices that you make? And sometimes being on that witness stand is going to be filled with hostility coming at us. Jesus warned Peter and the others about that. Everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. There will be days we face tough questions and and are held up in the court of public opinion and made fun of and who knows what else. But even when that happens, we can count ourselves blessed. We say, wait a minute, blessed? Because we're put on trial by the world around us? And we can say, yes, because we're following Jesus' footsteps. He went there first so that he would give us the right words to say, the strength to make it, and the hope that even though life might be miserable, even though the attacks are strong, we always have the victory in Jesus. Peter was afraid and gave a horrible testimony. (laughs) Poor guy. But Jesus didn't give up on him, did he? I wonder how difficult it was for Peter from Friday through Sunday. The guilt, the shame. How could Jesus love me? Is is he gone forever? And when the women came back and said, hey guys, guess what? The tomb's empty. We saw Jesus. He said, go to Galilee and he's going to appear to you there. And what did Peter and John do? They ran to the tomb and found nothing which is really cool, but they didn't realize it. And then Jesus appeared to to him, to them. And he appeared to Peter again, especially by the Sea of Galilee. And there he reinstated Peter and showed him his ultimate forgiveness when he said, Peter, I want you to feed my lambs. Feed my sheep, Peter. Feed my lambs. Three times Jesus said that to him. Three times washing away each of those denials and giving him exactly what he needed to be a beautiful witness to the people of the world. And so Peter did that. He wrote a letter to a group of Christians who looked really strange to the rest of the world. This was a group of people who were doing the opposite of what the world said was the right thing to do. So they were honoring the emperor, even though the emperor didn't deserve honors. Husbands were loving wives and and showing them respect Even though the world said, husbands, you just rule over your wives. And and wives, Christian wives, were submitting to their husbands, even though the world said, why should you do that? You're just being his slave. And speaking of slaves, Christian slaves were actually obeying their masters and being respectful and staying and serving and working. While the rest of the world said, escape, get out from underneath that burden. Why were they acting so strange, so different? And Peter said, now when you get that question, here's what you do. 
Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer, to give testimony. And not like Peter's testimony in the courtyard. No, I don't know him. But boldly stand and say, yeah, I know him. I know Jesus. And not only do I know him, but I know he loves me. And can I just tell you a little bit about why and how that's affected my life? Always be prepared to give an answer, to give that testimony. Because we have the greatest God, the great I Am, the Son of God, our Savior, who stands for us, who gives the most beautiful testimony when he says, you are mine. I am the good shepherd. You are my sheep and I know my sheep. My sheep know me. Is he lying? No, his testimony is true and powerful and embraces us with his love. So as we point to him, the one who has loved us so beautifully, so perfectly, he's given us the perfect testimony to share with everyone around us. And so we share it. Because Jesus is our testimony. Amen. The peace of God that covers all of our understanding, I pray that that peace will cover your hearts and your minds tonight and always. Amen. At this time we have the opportunity to respond with our gifts of thanksgiving for all, all that Jesus has done for us. Before we continue with the, the prayers on the screen, do you have any special requests that you would like to make tonight? I'm going to add one uh, for David, the son of Maxine, who is at the bridge. She said her son David, who has been ill now, is coming down from Denver to visit her. And so she asked that we would pray for his safe travels. So we'll pray for David. Anybody else have any requests tonight? Jeff? Very good, thank you. John? All right, and you said Evie? Uh, Effie. Effie, okay, got it. Will do, all right, anybody else? And it's for Laurel and Don. Laurel and Don, yep, thank you. Yeah. And then we'll pray for the Wagon Connects too. If you did not hear the news, Pastor Nathan Wagon Connect accepted the call to serve as the World Native American Network Coordinator. And so they'll be moving in, in this summer sometime, but we'll pray that, that everything goes smoothly for them. So would you please stand and join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, your, your witness and your testimony is always true. And so when you speak of your great love and care for us, we trust that it's true. So we pray for everyone on our list tonight, for David, for everyone who's traveling to the memorial this weekend, for Laurel and Don as they work in, as they work in Grand Junction. Lord, please be with each one of them as they travel. Keep them safe. Keep them filled with, with joy at the opportunities that they have and, and the visits that they make. And then, Lord, bring everybody back home safely. Please watch over Evie in the hospital. Lord, grant her body healing because of your great strength and love. We ask all these things in your name, and we continue with our responsive prayer. O oh God, our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. Your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Lord, please be with Pastor Wagon Connect and his wife and children as they make their preparations to move. Thank you for leading him to come here and serve. Bless the work that they do to reach out to the native population throughout North America. We ask this also in your name. Amen. And please be seated, and we'll join together in singing the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven.
And as we leave tonight, once again, God pours out his blessing on us so that wherever we go and whatever we do, he is with us, guiding us, giving us his strength and hope. So may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight is one that we have used a couple times before. It's a beautiful evening hymn and prayer called Jesus Tender Shepherd Hear Me. If you, were, if you heard the music as you came in at the beginning of the service, you heard that song being sung. I'll, I'll lead you through verse 1, and then you, know, you can certainly start singing right off the bat, but if you'd like to follow along, please feel free to do that. <laughs> 